Uh, good morning all. It's really a blessing to be able to say welcome and for those that are listening online I just want to say uh, may God bless you today. Today it's just something uh, and we are going to just work from uh, the letter of uh, Paul to Philemon uh, in the New Testament of the Holy Bible and uh, I think this is a unique letter and I believe that uh, you will be ministered to with this letter particularly around the area of where if you have to let go of the past and also if you have to seek forgiveness because of what the Lord has done so um, I think I just believe that this will be a blessing to you and so welcome again and for those listening later in the YouTube channel I want to say that uh, you know I believe that this message will minister to you as much as it has ministered to me uh, very powerfully so how about we just dive into prayer Heavenly Father when we are in prison and maybe not in a real prison but in an emotional prison where we have unforgiveness and we can't let go of the past because honestly what has happened with the person that we are not able to let go it's not fair what they have done Lord father thank you Lord that when we go through your word your word will cut through our bone and marrow our soul and spirit and liberate us from the captivities that we are in and help us to get freedom when we feel this strong aggrieving and justification Lord and that has pulled us down we know that we are not fulfilled and we are living a life where we are walking even though we have freedom we're still dragging a chain so Lord we call upon you that you will answer our prayers and uh, you will hear our prayers Lord and bring victory to us I pray this in Jesus name Amen uh, look I really want to encourage you that this word is going to be an amazing word and the reason why I say it's amazing is because this is the word of God it's not because of what I am talking to you it is not because of what the way I speak it to you it is just the merit of the Word of God for what it is I don't need to add anything to it I don't need to sugarcoat it I don't need to spice the word up the word in itself in its entirety is enough and fulfilling and satisfying and the only thing that can cut through us and judge, divide our thoughts and attitudes and bring us back to repentance there is no other thing but the word of God through the power of his Holy Spirit so this is my encouragement to, to keep an open mind particularly if you know that you are right now struggling with letting go of the past and uh, because honestly what has been done in the past is genuinely distressing and it is not justified I'm talking to you today and may the Lord minister to you through the word and through the power of his Holy Spirit to regenerate in you his um, his presence so what I want to really say is that Paul was the one who wrote this book or this letter <clears throat> to Philemon and the Apostle Paul got his direct revelation of Jesus Christ on the way to on the road to Damascus when he was about to persecute the churches and obviously what happened is a dramatic transformation and the one that was supposed to pursue the chief persecutor of the church became the chief prosecutor for the fact of the argument that Jesus Christ did come in flesh and he was the one that was able to remove all sin so the persecutor of the gospel became the one that was able to prosecute for the gospel so I just want to say that is a powerful transformation of someone who was in religion suddenly being engaged in a relation with the living God so what a transformation and I pray that each one of us will be transformed in a snap like this the way the mighty living God touched Paul on the way to Damascus even Mark and Paul talks about these characters some of these characters like Mark uh, in this uh, letter of Philemon uh, Mark a disciple of Peter who wrote the gospel of, jo uh, of Mark and then Luke a disciple of Paul uh, Paul talks about him also in Philemon and uh, Paul was a, Luke was a disciple of Paul and so he wrote the gospel of Luke and also Acts and uh, uh, I think uh, Paul was called supernaturally 
in an encounter with Jesus just after uh, Jesus ascended to heaven. And Paul was, Saul of Tarsus was actually um, persecuting the churches uh, after the death of Stephen. And then suddenly, miraculously, a uh, change happened and it was dramatic transformation. Paul had a big explosion of the gospel all around and he wrote predominantly most of the books of the New Testament, particularly the letters were mostly written, those marked in blue, are all written by Paul, those written in dark blue that you can see, Romans, Galatians, Thessalonians, Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, Philemon, Timothy, and Titus. So a significant amount of work done by one that used to persecute the church. And Paul wrote Philemon while he was in prison in, in Rome, and obviously in house prison, and obviously, uh, you know, he was writing to, uh, in, uh, uh, to the church of Colossae, where Philemon was a member. So obviously well before his death, and when he was in, uh, you know, because his death was about seven years, approximately four to seven years later. Um, we're not sure which year exactly it was written, but somewhere in the 1860s. So, I mean, uh, definitely, uh, you know, important to recognize before, this was before uh, he was about to be executed. Uh, it was well before he was about to be executed. So what is Philemon? What is the big picture? Well, it is just two things. One is to forgive and two is to have unity. And I can understand and appreciate forgiveness. You can let go of the person with the maybe the understanding that I will not have an interaction with the pay, with, with the person that aggrieved me. But, you know, I'm not going to actively pursue a fellowship with the person because I just feel I want to keep my distance and space. So I can appreciate that part of forgiveness, definitely, which I think it's in itself is difficult and needs God's grace. But I think what Paul is asking is more than just forgiveness and letting go and then living a free life is to go the extra mile and actually join with the person in doing the work that you are doing or very much bringing back that person into your personal space, your pers personal vision and what the Lord has done for you and really to go and do the co-working together. Now, I'm not so sure about that uh, in the context of humanity, whether that's possible. So Paul's really literally asking not just for the baseline of forgiveness and letting go, uh, Paul is asking Philemon of going the extra mile of not just the baseline, but going above the baseline and saying, hey, join with this person that you agree with and uh, partner in the strategic work that the Lord has imparted upon in you. So, you know, that's really a challenge, I would say. I mean, this in itself is a challenge. So this in itself, I would say, is pushing it and stretching it beyond our comfort zone and i think that's what christian life is it's really about being stretched beyond our comfort zones so the book of philemon is basically three characters one is paul the one who wrote the book or the wrote the letter and two is philemon who is an elder uh, of the church in Colossae, and probably one of the leaders in which to whom uh, paul is writing this letter so the and Paul is writing on behalf of a spiritual son of Paul, whose name was Onesimus. Now Onesimus, to give the context, was previously Philemon's slave. And obviously Onesimus wronged Philemon and escaped to Paul. And Onesimus uh, aggrieved uh, Philemon very much, which in those days, if the slave master was aggrieved by the slave, that would usually mean imprisonment or capital punishment for the slave. So a pretty serious offense. Onesimus went to Paul and then got discipled by him, transformed by him. And Paul literally says that Onesimus is Paul's spiritual son. So Paul is sending back Onesimus, the slave who agreed Philemon, with a letter back to Philemon through Onesimus saying, Onis, uh, Philemon, I commend you, my spiritual son Onesimus, forgive him and look after him and reconcile and become one in the gospel. So this is the amazing letter. So technically, 
Onesimus probably had a risk and a fear because what's going to happen when Philemon reads the letter? Is he going to do the right thing or is he going to execute him? So essentially it is about slaves. In those times, uh, in, in those periods, slavery was acceptable. And Paul was not addressing slavery as being wrong. But Paul went beyond the law and said it's about love. And both the slave and the master being free of the bondage that slavery affords and to be equal partners in the gospel because the Lord came both for the slaves and the masters, the Jews and the Gentiles, the men and the women, the, 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 the holes and the, and the ill, and so the well and the ill. So God came for the world, so we are equal partners. So Jesus died on the cross, not just for uh, the slave masters, but also for the slaves. So you need, Paul is requesting Philemon, you know, you're an elder of the church. You are preaching all these things. Now I urge you to actually do the right thing by putting this gospel that you're preaching, which is the true gospel, not the false gospel. He is encouraging and saying, this is a true gospel. I want to say this is a brilliant one. Um, go forth and, uh, you know, bring it in action. So it's a pretty power packed, explosive letter which has an amazing way that Paul writes and a tactfulness that I, see, I think we all need to learn from in terms of how to address conflict and how to also address the issue fair and square by holding it directly and addressing and confronting in love. Now, remember, Paul did not go to Colossae. Paul was three and a half years in Ephesians. And at that time, and many people from here went around to other places. There was no evidence that Paul actually visited the church of Colossae. But in saying this, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the letter of, to, of Philemon was addressed to Philemon, who was in a church in Colossae, uh, that Epaphras, uh, one of the elders, founded. And then later, when Epaphras was with Paul in prison in Rome, um, Paul wrote this letter to Philemon, saying, who was an elder. So, uh, basically, uh, you know, Onesimus moved from here and went to Paul. So you can see there's a lot of things happening. So let's see. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brothers. Obviously, you can see that Paul was not just literally a born servant of Christ. He was also in prison when this happened or probably in house arrest. And along with him was Paul's spiritual son, uh, uh, Timothy, who... Uh, wrote many of his books as much as Luke was also Timothy was the one that he called his spiritual son and his brother and spiritual son so Paul was in prison but yet he was an amazing ambassador of Jesus Christ so he's addressing it as you can see to three people to Philemon uh, who is a beloved elder probably a leader in the church of Colossae and a fellow laborer with Christ so definitely doing the right thing not the wrong thing to Aphia and Achippus, our fellow soldiers. Now, textual references, poor probably, uh, you know, you have to read this in church. So while this is a personal letter, so obviously this might not have been actually re uh, read in church, Paul also wanted to cover the base. And I think Aphia was probably uh, Philemon's uh, better half or life partner or wife, uh, I'm assuming. But again, there is no evidence for that, but definitely someone highly regarded and a female, so definitely uh, females were also included in ministry at that time. Now, Archippus, interestingly, could have been an elder of the church or could have been their son, Philemon and uh, Aphia's son. But in saying this, obviously, they were meeting in a church. They were having a church in Philemon's house. So at that time, church house churches were the go because there was no buildings. And I think probably now that we had this COVID-19 recession, you can see that buildings have become, church buildings have become irrelevant. The biggest thing is going back to the roots of the way the first century churches actually were. It's predominantly, there is a large uh, growth of house churches globally and house fellowships because of the fact that people realize the importance of fellowship. So significant work happening in Colossae in Philemon's house. And so obviously Paul was addressing Philemon with the intention that obviously if Philemon did not listen, his fellow co-workers of the family would be able to lovingly correct Philemon that he was on the wrong track. So Paul was very strategic in the way 
he covered his bases. And Archippus, let's say he was the son, obviously then he would be able to coax Philemon to do the right thing. Or perhaps if Archippus was an elder, then definitely the elder would say, hey, you, you, you are the pastor of the church and the leader, but you're not doing the right thing. So, you know, there's a moral, uh, Paul has exposed Philemon's vulnerability and saying you have no ways to escape this reality that I'm about to tell you. So brilliant. So he greets him and then says, may God bless you. You know, his standard customary, Paul always says grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's his customary greeting. And, uh, you know, he's got a customary benediction and also a customary introduction or a greeting. So definitely you can see that that is Paul, Paul and Paul and Paul and Paul. So, you know, Paul says, you know, I am so thankful that Philemon, you are doing well. I thank God and I mention you in your prayers because guess what? You are doing an amazing job because I pray for you daily because I have seen that you are really in love with Jesus. You are amazing in your faith. And the way you and your church is ministering to the people of Colossae, it is absolutely a testament towards not you or your family or society, but towards Lord Jesus. So you know what, Philemon, good on you for doing the good work of the Lord. And praise God that you are not influenced by false teachers, but that you are continuing on the true and straight, narrow path, which is going to bring glory to God. And not only that, the way you do your church is a blessing to many other saints. Now, saints means those who actually went and spread the gospel and probably became martyrs or were persecuted, but yet continued in the gospel. So, you know, many people are encouraged, Philemon, by the way you manage your house, church, by the way you manage your, your family, by the way you manage your elders and your, people, your congregants, and the way you submit to apostolic leadership like me, Paul. I am blessed. May you be an example to everyone because you, you are a model church. And it's amazing that you share the faith and the way you share your faith practically. I pray that you'll become more effective. So obviously, you know, Philemon is doing a good job. And obviously, Paul, and one of the biggest things in apostolic leadership is not control, but to try and promote the leadership to be able to excel to the next level of, you know, spiritual maturity by going to the next level. So Paul spurring Philemon and encouraging Philemon that, you know, you're in the right track. You're not corrupt. You're not diluted. You're not polluted. But to make you more effective. So Paul's not accusing Philemon. Paul's just giving a glowing testimony of Philemon's faith, his love for the, what he's doing and love for Jesus. And so uh, Philemon is a right standing, well-respected elder across the board and praise God. And I pray that we also will be called like that when, you know, Jesus comes well done, uh, good and faithful servant for having followed your race and completed your race uh, uh, faithfully and steadfastly. That would be probably the greatest reward that I would like to hear in the ministry that I do while I'm in this world. So, and I pray that that will be your, your prayer also, that you, you will be called well done, faithful servant for doing my will. So, you know, Paul was not saying, hey, mostly Paul addresses false teaching in most of his letters, and most of the letters are addressing false teaching. Even Jesus is addressing false teaching. But this is not about false teaching. This is not about the church politics. This is a personal letter to Philemon and his family and the church. And I think there is something to be learned about that. You know, people say, why was this personal letter put in this? Because this is not about the church doctrine or correction for the church, everything is going right. And I think what we need to recognize is that sometimes we can be blinded by certain things and God sees those flaws and wants us to come to the next level. So perhaps you are stagnated and you know that you are doing everything right, but there's still something in you that you know you're not correctly, you're not 100% sure. 
this is for you. I believe Philemon also went through such a thing. For we have great joy, Paul is saying, even though we are in prison, we have great joy and consolation because you have been such a blessing to many of us. When I come, you have been a blessing to me. When the saints come to your house and to your church, brother, you have gone beyond the call of duty in being able to provide hospitality for us, great food for us, great uh, you know, time for us to heal from the persecution and given us opportunity to speak in the church, given us opportunity to minister and disciple people in your church. And yeah, just given us a free opportunity and a free reign and praise God that you, Philemon, are amazing. And you know, you are a blessing. So Philemon is not being accused of anything wrong here, but is just a glowing testimonial. And that's brilliant. Now that he has, this is called the sandwich technique, I think, you know, giving a glowing testimony, then addressing the issue, and then finally closing and saying, you know what, I am so grateful that we know that you will do the right thing. It's not uh, you are going to do this, but we are grateful that you will do the right thing because of who you are. So then the ghost cuts the chase of what the letter is all about. So pretty much out of the 22 verses, the first one third is about Philemon's glowing testimony. And then he comes to the crux of the matter, which is a narrow, a small part. Then he again goes to uh, building up Philemon and encouraging him. Therefore, so obviously you can see this is a build up to something that Paul wanted to do. Therefore, I thought I might be bold in Christ, not in my, I mean, Paul had every authority to be bold in himself and say, Philemon, I expect you to do it. But he went in humility and said, in Christ, can I command you of what is fitting? Which means that there is something that he believes, Paul believes that Philemon should be doing because that is what Jesus would have also loved to see. Have you ever put on that bracelet which says, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And obviously, it's not just a cliche bracelet, but it is something that you believe you would like to do based on what Jesus would like to do. So Philemon was being encouraged by Paul. Hey, would you like to do what Jesus would have done? Then, well, guess what? This is what, you know, it's not out of me having an apostolic leadership over you that I appeal, but I appeal to you in love. So Paul's not coming with that authorit authoritarian, which he had every right to as the apostolic leader. Paul said, you know, I'm appealing to you, Philemon, not in that, but in love. As an aged, elderly Paul, who is right now a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now, Philemon, you know that I work tirelessly for the gospel. You know that I'm getting aged. My eyesight is getting poor. And, uh, but in, I'm also being imprisoned. And I'm not sure how long I will live. And you have given me high respect and you follow my apostolic leadership. You know how much I love Jesus Christ, uh, and I know how much you love Jesus Christ, Philemon. So Philemon, I am appealing to you as an elderly Paul, uh, in, not in my apostolic leadership, but in the apostolic grace that God has given in love. Can I appeal to you? So you can see he's building up to something. Philemon, I am appealing to you for my son Onesimus whom I have begotten while in chains. So basically, Paul brings in the first half, the last, the last part of the first half, boom, the message of what it is. It is just probably, I, I guess Philemon probably will be reading the first nine verses and said, yeah, 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 obviously there's something good happening. And as he's um, uh, probably as he's reading through, I'm just wondering how he would have reacted to verse 10. He probably wrote it, pardon me? Let, me, let me read that again. What did he say? I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. Onesimus? Is, this the, is he talking to Onesimus that I grieve me? Whom I have begotten while in chains. I'm not sure how uh, Philemon would have reacted to this. But I think one thing I realized is that he was probably taken aback by that. Whoa, what? All this glowing testimonial, and this is what it is, Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in chains. What does that mean? So what happened was Onesimus went back to Paul 
and Paul, while he was in prison, really discipled Onesimus. Onesimus got transformed. And Onesimus, Onesimus knew that what he did was wrong. And Paul urged Onesimus to take the letter with him to Philemon, ask for forgiveness to his master Philemon, and present the letter. And may Philemon read the letter and make a decision on what to do. So Paul acknowledges, you know what, Philemon? Onesimus has wronged you. He was absolutely useless. So unprofitable, meaning useless to you. But he is now, uh, Philemon, he was profitable and is pro profitable to me. You know the irony of this statement? The name Onesimus means useful. But what happened is that he was supposed to be useful to Philemon but he became useless to Philemon or unprofitable to Philemon and he ran away. But God in his infinite grace made the one who was supposed to be useful, who in his will became useless, in, or in human will of Onesimus will became useless when he went running to a place where he probably thought he would get refuge. God in his infinite grace used Paul to make Onesimus useful which is his name and profitable so can you see something when you are running away from things remember that god still has you covered and the very thing that you're running away from god wants you to take that away and turn it away so that you will be able to minister in the very exact point of where you are paying you know why people get offense and unforgiveness and don't want to let go let me just encourage you about something that is the same place that you have to minister to and god wants you to minister to mostly not in every case in most cases but if we don't allow god to work in that area and heal us and liberate us how can we then show others that same pathway of redemption healing restoration and reassurance that we went through so philemon was being asked by uh, Paul, you are doing great, but and you thought he was unprofitable, and Onesimus thought he was unprofitable too, but the very thing that he thought he was not, he has become by God's grace. So this is why I am telling you, give him a second chance, because now on Onesimus has transformed and become profitable. So I am sending him back, you therefore receive him, that is my own heart. So this itself is a death sentence. The slave master had every right to ask the Roman soldiers to come and arrest the slave and probably imprison him or execute him. Now, I can understand Paul asking someone else, like maybe Timothy, to send the letter first as a buffer to Philemon, give him the letter, talk to him, ameliorate the situation, then uh, once... Philemon says, yeah, yeah, it's okay. I forgive Onesimus. Bring him so I can talk to him. Paul actually made Onesimus go through a walk of faith. So the very Onesimus that ran away, taking probably something of valuable to uh, of Philemon, Onesimus was asked by Paul to take something valuable to Paul, his heart, his letter, and take it back and face the giants and face the things that Onesimus escaped. So it's a two-way uh, uh, ministry here it's a roadway to redemption to both and philemon was encouraged in that letter please receive him because this is my heart so paul is saying hey i'm giving in this letter my heart i know you will take care of my heart quite well you won't trample my heart so here is my heart in this letter take care of that heart on behalf of me and receive him. receive him onesimus so I'm just, just wondering how would have Onis, uh, Philemon reacted to the letter? How would Onesimus have given the letter? Probably the interpretation of what's going to happen. Philemon probably saying, what is this? And looking at the letter and then looking at Onesimus and saying, you know, I probably should read it again because I'm blinded by rage maybe. Either way, you can see Paul's letter is quite powerful and weighty and impactful. And this is what Paul says, because he, uh, Onesimus was so useful. Look, I wish to keep him. I really wish to keep 
Onesimus because he's doing a brilliant job. Just like Philemon, you are doing a brilliant job in Colossae. I want to tell you, Onesimus is doing a fabulous job here in prison with me. And that on your behalf, he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. You thought that this guy was useless. But I want to tell you, Onesimus has become so resourceful, useless, and, you know, uh, 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 precious and priceless that his invaluable services and the way he ministers the gospel while I am in prison here is spectacular and phenomenal. I can't commend enough what he is doing. So my dear Philemon, this Onesimus that ran away from you is not the Onesimus that at this stage is in front of you. So receive him because he is definitely a mighty minister of the gospel. As much as you are a mighty minister, Philemon of the gospel, as much as me, Paul, your apostolic leader, is a mighty minister of the gospel in God's grace, I want to tell you that the useless uh, uh, Onesimus that you thought was good for nothing has become so useful for the gospel that we are all equal in the eyes of the Lord in this gospel. So Paul is telling that there is no slave or there is no slave master. Everyone has become equal in the ministry of the gospel. And so Philemon probably will be saying, what is this? Isn't this a radical shaking of the institutional values where slavery is completely acceptable? So you can see Paul was not saying slavery is wrong. Paul was going beyond that. Sometimes it's not about being politically correct that we need to look at. But in love, we love beyond the political correctness because that is the political correctness is the baseline. We exceed the baseline. Christianity is not about living in the baseline. Christianity is about living above the base, exceeding the baseline and going the extra mile. So this is what Philemon was encouraged by Paul. But you know what Paul in those days and today also apostolic leaderships could have demanded you do this because this is my command as your apostolic leader or as your bishop or as your senior pastor so please follow it but paul is so gracious and humble he was telling philemon philemon while you're submitted to my leadership and while you are entitled absolutely as the pastor or the leader of that church to do what you should do I really want to ask your permission because I did not want to, you to receive Philemon, uh, sorry, Onesimus without, you, without your permission. I wanted to do nothing without you knowing about it. I could have gone straight away and told the church that this is what I want and they would gladly do that and you would have to comply with that, which I had the power to do, but I'm not doing it in that. So you can see Paul is telling, even though I had the authority, I was not, I'm not doing that. So Philemon, remember that what I'm telling you is out of grace and out of love and humility. But without your good consent, I will not override. I honor your leadership. I honor the way you're doing the good work, Philemon. So I want to ask you permission, which is very unheard of in those times. That your good deed of you going to receive Onesimus might not be my dear Philemon out of compulsion of me trying to impose upon you which I have every right but I'm not using that right but I want it to be absolutely from your heart voluntary you know Jesus never forces us to forgive Jesus never forces us to let go Jesus always wants you to let go because it is the best thing and I want to encourage you today. He will never force you. But if you know today that right now, you know that you have been convicted that you have to let go. The, very, the way Paul said, I would like to ask you, not in the authority that I have in the way I preach the gospel, but in the grace that God has given for me to preach the gospel. I'm asking you to let go, not by force, but voluntarily of that offense that bitterness, that hurt, that wrongdoing the person did and let go and may freedom come to you. And I pray that you will do this voluntarily and not forcefully. 
And I pray that you will be liberated and you'll be set free from your captivity. That's my prayer, folks, as you listen to this message. So very much similar is what Paul said to Onesimus in that stage. So I think that shows to you how much we also need to be voluntarily able to do these things, not, in, not forcefully. So what is it that he wants to do voluntarily? Well, for the purpose of, this is the purpose for Onesimus, and the purpose of Philemon with Onesimus. Why should Onesimus be reconciled to Philemon? And why should Philemon take the choice of reconciling with Onesimus? That, hey, that while he perhaps departed for a while for this purpose, to know his purpose, but perhaps maybe he departed and came to me to grow and be steadfast and not be useless, but useful, because that is his name and come back and become useful to you. So I want you perhaps maybe to consider, maybe Philemon came back, sorry, Onesimus came back because now he has become what God wants him to become. So he's gonna be a great asset and a resource to you. So brilliant, go for it and may God minister to you and bless you. So that's what uh, uh, Onesimus was being really, uh, Philemon was being challenged with, to receive Onesimus with full heart. Now, I can understand receiving with full heart and forgiving, but then Paul increases the expectation and says, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave. Now, obviously slavery was absolutely fine at that time, but Paul was saying this time, not as a slave in the gospel, but as a beloved brother, bam. So basically Paul says, Onesimus is to be your brother. So Philemon, this one that aggrieved you and rightfully that you are wrong, you, you, you are upset, I pray you will forgive him. And not only forgive him, accept him not as a slave anymore, but as a beloved brother. Now this is breaking every institutional barriers and everything that the very institution of Rome was built upon. So it is a huge social upheaval, a social revolution. And I think this is a thing that would shake the very institution of slavery. So imagine the slave that aggrieved the slave master coming back and the slave master accepting the aggrieved slave as not just being forgiven, which itself is a big thing, not just wiping off all the, the, the debts and all the wrongdoing, which is a great thing, not just accepting him back as a slave into the household, which is a big thing, but not just doing that, but accepting him as a brother, giving him every rights as a free man and every rights as a free Roman and giving him probably wealth and a, a shelter and probably appropriate rights as a citizen and making him probably an active member of the church doing the ministry alongside Philemon. Now that is pushing it, but that's what Paul was asking. And this is why I wanna ask you, forgiveness is easy. What about the next step of working with this person? May God give you the grace to do that as you move forward. So that's my prayer and encouragement. So why does, Philemon, why is Philemon expected by Paul to do this? Especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So there is a spiritual reason as much as there is a physical reason. There is an emotional reason as much as there is a physical, uh, a spiritual reason. So Paul is saying, all of these are really there to try and help you to make sure that you understand that you will be free in your body, free in your mind and be able to do the work of the Holy Spirit in the Colossus Church of Colossae in a mighty manner. And this is why you want to be absolutely free. So may I recommend, may I encourage you that just the way, Lord, to me how much you were blessed by me, both in flesh and in the Lord, 
the way I was blessed by, blessed by you, both in the flesh and in the Lord, by what you have done. Can I please implore you, request you humbly to extend the same courtesy and refresh Onesimus, uh, give him a shelter, give him food, uh, give him rights, give him an opportunity in the church and look after him as your brother. Go the extra mile and all because of the living God's teaching that you are doing, not just for me, even though you are entitled, I'm entitled and I can demand it. I'm not demanding it, I am requesting it. What a brilliant technique of being able to just pass his message. You know what, five verses, he's just the next half, one third, Philemon talks about, sorry, Paul talks about accepting Onesimus back. Wow, that's called tactfulness and wisdom in ministry. Now why? Philemon is further encouraged. Remember the first part, one, seven, one third of the book was encouragement. And the last part is also encouragement. Hey, Philemon, I know you will do the right thing. Not because I'm forcing you, but because you are my partner. You are an equal with me. Now, Paul not just talks about the fact that you should receive him. He says, look, I'm happy to pay you back. So obviously, you know, one of the biggest things in the Christian ministry is to be able to repay fully and not to be able to take advantage of someone. So, you know what, Philemon, I'm not going to take advantage of you. I'm actually going to pay you whatever he has done wrong and to pay you restitution, put it on my account. So Paul's quite you know, upfront that he is happy to pay because that's how much he believes in Onesimus and the fact that he, this Onesimus, which was, who was use, useless, has now become useful. And I think he will become... Paul saying, Philemon, test me in this. I want to challenge you if Onesimus is not useful to you. And you will see an amazing uh, way that he becomes so. So put it on my account. I'm happy to pay that. Now that, I guess the last thing to get converted is the wallet. So obviously, if Phile uh, Paul's really so adamant, that means there must be something unique. And you know what? I'm not using a scribe to use that. Paul probably was getting aged and, you know, his eyesight uh, might have been failing him. So usually Timothy or Luke might have written some of these things or some other scribe like Sylvanus. But he's saying, I, Paul, I'm writing this with my handwriting. So basically I'm writing it with my hand. So this is my testament. And you know me, I'm a man of my words and I will not mince my words. My yes is a yes and my no is a no. So you can be rest assured that I will pay you if you need the payment, absolutely no problem. However, in saying this, I also want to say, and Paul's brilliant, I will repay, but not to mention that you owe me even yourselves besides. So obviously Paul's saying, remember also that uh, Philemon, that your whole life, your Christian life was based on my ministry and how I was able to absolutely follow God's will and love you and persistently follow you so that you who were lost would be found and be turned back to him. Paul was not boasting about him being that great person converting or transforming Philemon, but he was talking about Philemon, the infinite grace that the Lord gave him and how God used Paul to be blessing Philemon in a time when Philemon needed that. So the eternal life that Philemon has right now, the stage up and the uh, the spiritual status that Philemon has, the, all the respect that Philemon has, everything is because of God and God used Paul as a messenger to bring the message. So Philemon, don't forget that. So obviously Paul's reminding him of Philemon's past and saying, you're not any better in terms of what you have done compared to Onesimus. So, hey, one of the things that we need to look in Christian life is before we judge another person, we need to look and see where we are in God. And that probably will give us a reality check and a perspective. The Bible says, in, in Jesus says, before you take the speck of dust from your brother's eyes, ask God to show the plank and the log that is in your eyes to remove that. So probably that's what Paul was alluding to here, that we need to be really having a realistic expectation of what this is. But in saying this, you know what, my brother, give me happiness. You know, I am in prison. You want to serve me. You love me, my dear Philemon. You want to honor me. 
give me the joy in the Lord, refresh my heart in this bleak time when I'm in prison and show me the goodwill uh, and extend to me the courtesy as I commend to you, Onesimus. And do the right thing, my dear brother, my dear, my dear spiritual uh, uh, mentee, and uh, refresh me. I just want to be happy, and I pray that you will make me happy. And I have the confidence, Philemon ends there, Paul, and I have the confidence that you will obey me. And I write to you that you will do not just obey me, you will do more than that. I believe that you will not just forgive Onesimus. I believe that you won't just make him your brother. I, my prayer is that you will go the extra mile, not just the baseline, but you will also make sure that he maybe gets a property, gets a wife, is given enough respect, is given opportunity to preach in the church and be an equal worker with you as much as you are an important thing. And you know what? I look forward to seeing you and Onesimus Philemon, you and Onesimus working together hand in hand. And so I look forward to that. So prepare a guest room for me. I know your spectacular hospitality. I know that you are amazing in the way you treat me and every missionary. So I am looking forward to witnessing with my own eyes how you do that. So you know what? Prepare a room for me. I look forward to, I look forward to that. Now, there was no evidence that Paul later went to the church in Colossae. But in saying this, uh, it was interesting that Paul had such confidence in Philemon that Philemon will do the right thing. For I trust that through your prayers, I shall be granted to you. So basically, Philemon, I know every day you're praying for me to come and visit your church, visit you, enjoy your hospitality. And I pray that this will be an opportunity where God grants that prayer and I will truly be able to come and witness that miraculous moment of reconciliation and working hand in hand, you Philemon and Onesimus, the one that grieved you, where you're forgiven, working hand in hand as brothers, not as slave and slave master, as brothers for the advancement of the gospel. And so he was definitely encouraging Philemon to continue in this right track. And then Paul farewells by saying, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus also greets you. Now Epaphras was the bishop or the person that founded the church in Colossae and was highly regarded by Philemon, by the church in Colossae and really well, uh, well respected. And he was right now in prison along with uh, uh, Paul working with him. And so obviously Epaphras also agrees with Paul's recommendation. And Epaphras, who carries weight, is if he's in agreement, which means that obviously the church should be able to honor that agreement. So my prisoner in Christ Jesus, not because he did anything wrong, but he preached the gospel. That's why he's in prison. He also greets you and validates what I say to you. Not only do uh, Epaphras validate that Mark, the person who wrote the gospel of Mark, John Mark, who was with Paul and Barnabas, Aristarchus, uh, who was also a fellow worker from a, from, from a Greek or Roman origin. Demas, who late was a worker with Paul and in Timothy, in the book of Timothy, uh, you can see Paul saying, Demas deserted me and left me alone in the latter days of my life as I come to the end of my life. So this was a person who worked with Paul, but later deserted him. And then obviously Paul's traveling companion and the physician Luke who wrote and, and, and Paul's disciple in Jesus Christ, Luke the physician who wrote the gospel of Luke and Acts. So my fellow laborers, they all agree that this is the right thing to do. And I have done the right thing, I Paul, and I believe we all will encourage you and believe that you will do the right thing also finally. So thus in the quintessential benediction that Paul gives, he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So you can see the clear reference to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and how the Holy Spirit resides in him. So what we are going to do right now is just go through the Bible project, the video, to see what this Philemon is all about. Then I believe that the Holy Spirit has touched you, and we will pray, and just, uh, you know, pray based on what uh, has been mentioned here and shared here. So I'm going to share the Bible project from the uh, video and let's see what it has to say about the consolidation of uh, the, uh, of the uh, uh, thing in, uh, what do you call it, uh, in, in the book of Philemon.
Paul's letter to Philemon. It was written during one of Paul's many imprisonments, and it's actually his shortest letter in the New Testament, but don't let its size trick you. It's actually one of the most one of the most explosive things that Paul ever wrote. Here's the backstory that we can piece together from details within the letter. Philemon was a well-to-do Roman citizen from Colossae who likely met Paul during his mission in Ephesus and he became a follower of Jesus. Then later, when Paul's co-worker Epaphras started a Jesus community in Colossae, Philemon became a leader of a church that met in his house. Now, Philemon, like all household patriarchs in the Roman world, owned slaves, one of whom was named Onesimus. And at some point, these two had a serious conflict. Onesimus wronged Philemon in some way. Maybe it was theft or maybe he cheated him. We don't exactly know. But afterwards, Onesimus ran away. Eventually, Onesimus came to Paul in prison, likely to appeal for help. And in the process, he became a follower of Jesus and then a beloved assistant of Paul. And so Paul finds himself in a very difficult and delicate situation as he writes this letter. He's going to ask Philemon not just to forgive Onesimus and receive him back, but to embrace him as a brother in the Messiah and no longer as a slave. Here's how he does it. Paul opens with a prayer, first praising Philemon and thanking God for the love and faithfulness he's shown to Jesus, to his people. And he then paves the way for his request with this line. I pray that the partnership that springs from your faith may effectively lead you to recognize all the good things that work in us, leading us into the Messiah. Now, a key word here is partnership, or in Greek, koinonia. It means sharing or mutual participation. It's when two or more people receive something together and share in it, becoming partners. Paul's saying that faithfulness to Jesus means recognizing that all of his followers are equal partners who share together in the gift of God's love and grace. And for Paul, this experience of koinonia among Jesus' followers, it's not just an idea that you think about, it's something that you do in your relationships, which moves Paul onto his request. He finally brings up Onesimus. He says that he's become Paul's child in prison, meaning that Paul led Onesimus to dedicate his life and allegiance to Jesus. And so Paul and Onesimus are now family members in the Messiah. He's been serving Paul faithfully in prison, and even though Paul wants to keep him around, he knows that this unresolved conflict with Philemon has to be reconciled if they say that they're followers of Jesus, which moves Paul on to his bold request that Philemon receive Onesimus back no longer as a slave, but as more than a slave, as a beloved brother in the Lord. Now, this is a really tall order. Under Roman law, Philemon had every legal right to have Onesimus punished or put in prison. And Paul's not only asking him to forgive Onesimus, but to welcome back his former slave into Colossae as a social equal, as a family member. This is way more than kindness. This is unheard of. It's freeing a slave and then treating them like a family member. It upsets the status quo of the Roman social order. Why should Philemon do such a thing? And here Paul pulls a brilliant move. He recalls that key word from the opening prayer. He says, if you're truly a partner with me, it's that Greek word koinonia again, then welcome Onesimus as if he were me. And if he's wronged you or owes you anything, charge it to me and I will repay it. So in this request, we see the heart of Paul's gospel message being acted out. It's first of all about reconciliation. It's just like he told the Corinthians. In the Messiah, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. So in this situation, Paul is putting himself in the place of Jesus. He will absorb the consequences of Onesimus' wrongdoing. He will pay the cost so that he can be reconciled to Philemon. But Paul's message was about more than just a legal transaction. It's also about koinonia. Onesimus and Philemon and Paul are all equals before God. They all share the same need for forgiveness. And so the ground is level before the cross, which means that Philemon and Onesimus can no longer relate to each other as master and slave. They're family members. They're brothers in the Messiah. Or as Paul told Philemon and the whole church of Colossae, 
in God's new family, people are not Greek or Jewish or circumcised or uncircumcised or foreigners or uncivilized or slave or free, but the Messiah is all and is in all people. Paul closes the letter stating his confidence that Philemon will do even more than Paul's requested. And he asks him to prepare a guest room because he wants to visit as soon as he gets out of prison. And then with some final greetings, Paul ends the letter. Paul's letter to Philemon is powerful for many reasons. It's the only letter where Paul doesn't explicitly mention Jesus' death or resurrection, and this is not an oversight. He doesn't need to explain the cross with words because he's demonstrating it through his actions. Paul's embodying here the meaning of the cross. He has made himself the place through which Onesimus and Philemon are reconciled to God and then to each other. This letter also shows us that the implications of the good news about Jesus, they are extremely personal and never private. The fact that Philemon and Onesimus are now brothers in the Messiah, it makes their master-slave relationship totally irrelevant. The family of Jesus' people is the place where all are equal recipients of God's grace. It's a new kind of society or a new humanity, as he called it in the letter to the Colossians, where people's value and social status, it's not defined by race or gender or social or economic class. In the Messiah, there are simply new humans who are equal partners who share together in God's healing mercy through Jesus. And that's what Paul's letter to Philemon is all about. Well, I think you just saw what Philemon's message was. So obviously something to think of as you move into, you know, the opportunity of knowing that God is with you. So you know what, I just really want to just bless you and pray that today you will be able to reconcile yourself and come back to this living God, knowing that God gave you the same grace and exceedingly abundantly than probably your counterparts. But today you and me have the ability to be able to come here and to be able to just be blessed. So my prayer to you is that today you will really just know that it is a great time for you to be able to, uh, uh, you know, just turn back to this living God and surrender and just repent. So for those of you that are really struggling with forgiveness, unforgiveness or bitterness or offense, and, you know, because honestly, the right per the, the other person has done wrong to you. There is no uh, question about that. And I'm not trivializing that. But remember, there is a greater freedom that you get when you forgive and as you let go of things. And I believe that God will be able to use that to bring glory to his name by allowing you to grow more. So today my prayer to you, if you are in the position of Philemon, where you are offensed or grieved by someone, perhaps like Onesimus, and it's so raw, I pray that Holy Spirit will come and convict you about the need to forgive so that you can be liberated from the captivity that you are. So Heavenly Father, I submit each and every one that your word will do your word, Lord. There will be no further problems with your word because your word is self-sufficient, is able to do what it's supposed to do, and will never come back void without accomplishing your purpose. So Father, I pray that just the way Paul's words in your inspiration healed Onesimus, healed Philemon, I pray that it will go and heal right now those that are in the position of Philemon, uh, and also those that are in the position of Onesimus, and both will be healed reconcile coming together to bring glory to your name and i pray that the captivity that people are in will be liberated right now in jesus name and i pray this to bring glory to your name thank you lord in jesus name i pray this amen well you know what folks i hope you have been blessed may you continue to be liberated and victorious uh, we will do uh, one chapter again uh, one uh, new series next week but again in the meantime be blessed and be have freedom in the forgiveness of Christ. Thank you.